Welcome to First Baptist Church of Walnut Creek. We are glad you are here with us today. Here are some of our upcoming announcements. Our scripture reading today is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 through 13. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in them will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking forward and hasting the coming of the day of God, because which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, Look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwell. Welcome to First Baptist Church. Today is a topic that is rarely preached upon, but it should be. Preachers would rather tell you that God loves you or speak about perceived needs instead of addressing this important topic. 
It's a topic that every believer should have firmly fixed in their mind, but they don't. As our culture has eroded into secularism, meaning godlessness, it has done so entirely proclaiming the incredible advancements that society has made over the last 30, 40 years. I call to your attention the cell phone, how it has empowered us to communicate without the need of strings, or the computer and the advance uh, of artificial intelligence has promised to free us with more time. And of course, entertainment has given us the opportunity to go to any place that we want and to visit any fantasy that we wish to be part of. And of course, there are the medical advancements that we see coming out all the time that allow us to live longer and to live better. But what advancements have there been in the family? Today, it's estimated that one out of four children live in a home without a father. That doesn't sound like an advancement to me. But what about marriage? Today, 41% of marriages will end in divorce. But how about church attendance? The average church member, now members now, not people who just come on Christmas and Easter, but members attend church only two out of every five Sundays. The point of stating all this is not to cast blame, but to acknowledge that this is the condition of our culture today. This is the condition that we live in today. The Christian is called to be salt and light in the culture that we live in. We do not live in the 40s. We do not live in the 60s or in the 80s. We live in the 20s. And as salt and light, we are to preserve the world from corruption and condemnation. When salt is placed into an area, it acts to protect and to preserve. As light, we are to preserve a clear path to the truth. People will not be able to hear the good news of Jesus Christ if the light is hidden or if the light is constrained or refrained from getting out. Paul tells us that we are sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Ephesians 5.8, he says, For you were once of darkness, but now you are of light and, in, and of the Lord, and walk as children of the light. When Peter and Paul both came to a city, they boldly proclaimed the gospel of Christ. But they also proclaimed something else. They also told people about the day of the Lord. For every person must know about the consequences. What will happen if they reject the good news of Jesus Christ? What will happen if they say no to the fact that Jesus died and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day? What happens to our family members if they say, no, I don't want to believe it? Well, they were told that each person will face the Lord Jesus. And on that one day, as it's called in the Bible, is called the day of the Lord. It's not to be confused with the Lord's day, for the Lord's day is a day that's set aside for worship, but the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. In 2 Peter chapter 3, in fact, we see in this entire book, there were some people who Peter had been ministering to and had come into the church and they were denying the idea of a final judgment. In fact, they were stating that they were that they doubted that Jesus Christ would ever even return. You see, the day of the Lord hadn't happened yet, at least in their lifetime. And so they rejected the thought or the idea that it could ever happen. And yet, because Christ had not returned yet, and he'd only been gone not even a hundred years, and he had not returned as, as he promised in their lifetime, they began to question and doubt and to cast aspersions upon it. But there are three things that we should pull away from this passage in looking as we look at verses 8 through 13 in chapter 3 of 2 Peter. First is that the day of the Lord is on schedule. These are things that we should remember. Because as we look at the very beginning of chapter 3 and verse 1, we're reminded, he says, Beloved, beloved I write to you this second epistle, in both of which to stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. 
Peter wants to remind us, remind the, the reader of this letter, some very important facts. So again, the first thing he's reminding us is that the day of the Lord it's on schedule. The second thing we should remember from looking at verses 8 through 13 is that the day of the Lord is a divine judgment. And then finally, the last thing we should come away with is that the day of the Lord demands a response. And that's important for us to recognize and remember because we have to give a response. We're not left without an option on this. So let's begin with the very first thing as we look at verse 8 and 9. In verse 8, he says, But beloved... Do not forget that this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. We need to remember our very first point is that the day of the Lord is on schedule. A delay does not negate Christ's return. As Peter is writing this, he's perhaps thinking of Psalm 40, verse 4, where the psalmist is writing and saying, For a thousand years in your sight is like a day that has just gone by, or a watch in the night. Now remember, a watch in the night is just a scheduled time. It's sort of like your work schedule of eight hours. It goes by so quick, and then it's gone. It seems like it was there, and then it's gone. The Creator is not bound by His creation. And it's silly for man to think that his perspective is the same as God's. Some have tried to use this verse here to create a prophetic timetable. And they've done so by equating one biblical day equals 1,000 years, thereby creating a new meaning. Each day of creation now becomes a 1,000 years of human history. And the seventh day being still future, refers to the millennial time where Christ sets up his thousand-year reign. Yet there is no scriptural teaching for a day equaling a thousand years in prophecy. And in doing so, they destroy the purpose of this text. They destroy the purpose of Peter's explanation. And we need to be reminded of what Isaiah writes when the Lord says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. The delay here reminds us that there is a wonderful purpose. And that's what Peter is trying to focus on. Because there's a delay in Christ's return, there is a purpose for it. It's not creating some sort of crazy time schedule. It's just pointing out the character of God. The delay is because of God's long-suffering. God is not slack, meaning God is not weak or unable or impotent when it comes to keeping promise. Remember, God is the great promise keeper. The existence of Israel should be proof enough for all of us that God does keep his promises. Remember the Abrahamic covenant where God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that he would make them a great nation. Now, you might say, wait a minute. Israel is not as great as America or China or some other nation around the world. But I ask you this. Is America found in the Bible? No. Is China found in the Bible? Definitely not by name. Israel is found in the Bible, and God is not done with them. In fact, as you read to the end, you find out that there will be no nation on earth like Israel. Basically because no nation will have as its ruler the Messiah God in the midst of it dwelling there. So, we look at this and we say, and we look back and just say, okay, so the delay has a purpose. It's because of God's long suffering. God is waiting because he desires that all should come to repentance. That all means all, not just some. Not just, well, God's elected these and those are the ones he's waiting for. God wants everybody to come to repentance. God takes no pleasure at all in punishing the wicked. Some people think that God sits up in heaven and goes, yes, mess up one time because as soon as you mess up, bam, got him. Yes, I get to beat up on this creation. That's not the case at all. That's not the God of the Bible in any stretch of the imagination. God desires that every single one of his creation would repent, and I'll get to that in just a moment, and come to him. 
See, there's a certain pattern to God's judgments. Throughout the Bible, you can follow through and see this. First, God warns, and then God waits. God warns, and then He waits. He warns the people by say, stating and sending His message, divine judgment is coming, and then He waits. He waits for people to repent. And this is the problem that Jonah has, because Jonah knows the character of God. So God sends Jonah to Nineveh with a warning. Repent. Repent because judgment is coming. And Jonah has a fit, knowing the character of God, knowing that God is going to spare these people if they repent. If they, well, what do we mean by repent? We, gotta, we have to address that. We have to answer that. It means simply this, to change their mind about who God is. To change our mind, we are told to repent, to change our minds about who Jesus Christ is. You see, the Bible states, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. As we continue from John 3, 16 to 17, we're reminded God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that, through, that the world through Him might be saved. God's motivation or motivating fact in all of this is His long-suffering. But God's long-suffering is running out. Time is running out for all mankind. God wants everybody to repent, to change their minds, and hence Jesus Christ is presented before people as here He is. Change your mind who He is. Believe that He died for your sins and that He rose again from the dead. That's repentance. See, that's the problem that Jonah had, again, back going back to the Ninevites. They changed their mind and believed that God was able to destroy and wipe them out. And they took His message and they believed it. And Jonah... He sat and kept waiting, going, okay, they believe it. Maybe they're going to change their mind, and then God's going to whack them. But that never happened, at least in Jonah's time. So, we come to our second point. If time is running out, how much time is left? And that I don't know. But I do know in our second point, the day of the Lord is divine judgment. What is the day of the Lord? Well, first of all, it is doom for the unbeliever. Zephaniah, in chapter 1, gives us a clear picture of what's perhaps going on in Peter's mind. So if you turn your Bibles to Zephaniah, it's Old Testament, you're going to flip back, and you're going to find Zechariah, and then you're going to find some other books, Haggai, then Zephaniah. But if you go to chapter 1, it's dealing with the day of the Lord. Now listen carefully as I'm reading through this. In chapter 1, verse 2, it says, I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the birds of the heaven, fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks, along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will stretch out my hand against Judah, against the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Balaam, uh, uh, excuse me, Baal from the place in name of idolatry, priest with the pagan and priests, those who worship the host of heaven on the housetops and those who worship and swear oaths by God, but who also swears by Malcolm, those who have turned their back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquire of him. Be silent in the presence of the Lord God for the day of the Lord is at hand for the Lord has prepared a sacrifice, he has invited his guests. And it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children and all such that are clothed with foreign apparel. For in the same day I will punish all those who leap over the threshold, who fill their master's house with violence and deceit. And there shall be on that day, says the Lord, the sound of a mournful cry from the fish gate a wailing from the second quarter, and a loud crash from the hills. Wail, you inhabitants of Melchish, for the merchant people are cut down. All who handle money are cut off. And it will come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with a lamp, and I will punish men who are settled in the compl complacency, who have in their hearts, who say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do evil. Therefore, their good will become booty. 
their houses a desolation, and, their, and they shall build houses, but not inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. What we see of this, as we look through this in the day of the Lord, we see that God is judging the nation of Israel. The cities that he loves, he is dealing with the people who have been identified as following him first. And he is purging from them sin. All those who sin among them are being purged. And in fact, we see that their entire livelihood, their way of life is completely removed from them. Their leaders did not restrain them from sinning. We look at verse 8. He talks about punishing the princes. Because the leaders were there to stop the people from sinning and set a good example, but they didn't. So they are being punished. The religious leaders did not teach the people the ways of the Lord in verses 4 and 5. They are punished. In fact, the people themselves, they rejected God and instead replaced God with material things. It's uncanny the parallel as we look back into the nation of Israel's history and we compare it to our own. Although we are not the nation of Israel, it's striking how much that they did parallels our own current time. We see the truth of the matter is the unrighteous are punished throughout this entire time period of the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord is not only a time period of punishing the unrighteous, it is also hope for the believer. You're still in the same book, Zephaniah. Go to chapter 3 and look at verse 14. In verse 14, it states this, Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst, and you shall see disaster no more. In the day, or in that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion, let your hands be do not let your hands be weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with with singing. I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly. Who are among you to whom is reproach is bur- who re- who is a reproach? Uh, behold, at the time I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame. I will gather those who were driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. And at that time I will bring you back, even at a time I gather you, for I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. So in this passage part here towards the end, we see God is returning everybody. Their sins are removed. There is a perfect leader in their midst. The king is among the people. There is laughter. There is singing. We may not think or, or think of Jesus as laughing, but here's a passage where Jesus is laughing and he's singing among the people. And there's a promise that there will never be harm again. There is a healing, a restoration, and an appointment of the people in which they will be brought back and given responsibilities and things that they are to do. Now, all of that is taking place in the day of the, of the Lord. This is a time period in which God punishes the wicked and saves the righteous. And who is doing this? The Lord God, Jesus himself. That's what the day of the Lord is taking place, where people will give an account for what they've done wrong. Now, turn back to 2 Peter chapter 3. Because as Peter is laying this out, in verse 10 he says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and an element will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the workers that are in them will be found. Therefore, since these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for the hasting uh, of the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, We, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Well, first of all, let me just mention that part of this day of the Lord that Peter is mentioning here is a divine judgment of fire. It will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. No one is able to prepare for this event. 
people will be surprised by the timing. It will also be all-encompassing, meaning that fire will destroy everything. This will not be like a house that's on fire that will be burnt down or a forest that's set ablaze. This will be a heat of such magnitude that it will transform and change the very elements themselves. Now, for example, let's take a metal for, for like silver. Silver, in its solid form, we are very familiar with. Rings, necklaces, a lot of precious things that we, we enjoy to have. But when we heat it enough, it becomes liquid. But what happens when we heat it too much, when the temperature gets too hot? When we create the temperature so hot, we move it past its liquid. It evaporates. Once we've gotten the liquid too hot and it evaporates, we lose that silver, don't we? What we're seeing here is a core over the entire face of the earth. Things get so hot that they're not burnt down to ash. The temperature becomes so hot that they, there is nothing left of them. And it's universal. It's all the earth. This global judgment will wipe out all life, it will wipe out all the works, it will wipe out all the materials, and all the foundation on this planet and on heaven will be wiped out. And they go, how is that possible? I don't know how exactly it's possible. I just know it's a judgment of God and it's to be believed. Just like in Noah's day, the people did not believe Noah as he was talking about a flood that's coming and God's judgment of going to flood the world. The people scoffed and they mocked and they said, how can that be? Well, as Peter's talking about this judgment, divine judgment of fire, people are, are scratching their head going, how can this be? Some have thought that perhaps it's going to be a nuclear holocaust. I don't think so. I don't think it's going to be something like that where it's going to lay waste to the planet and have nuclear fall. I think this is going to be something that the hand of God does because as soon as he dissolves it, he's going to reform or create a new heaven and a new earth. So we see that although there's a, a change that's going to take place, there's also going to be a transformation. But it is key for us to remember that remember Noah lived with the expectation of divine judgment we also should live with the same expectation of judgment. How should we respond? That takes us to our third point as we look at verses 11 and 13. The day of the Lord demands a response. Look at verse 11. Therefore, since these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you be in holy conduct and godliness? What type of person should we be? This is a question that's really facing us today. I know that many people today are afraid to go outside. There's a great threat of catching the COVID virus that is paralyzing people. The thought of a person-to-person -person contact now carries with it the risk of becoming ill or even the potential of death to yourself or to family members that you love. Friends and family have become isolated so that we are staying away from one another. Businesses that are able to operate remotely have made decisions to do so. So much to the fact that they are looking at almost uh, nine months to a year down the road of not coming back at the workstations. But what about the education of young people? No one believes that this education is equal to the traditional education, even though we've had all these wonderful improvements with technology. And the mental health problems that we have today seem to be skyrocketing as people are, are facing the, the problems of being isolated. People are being categorized as non-essential. Depression and suicide is on the increase in huge amounts. And we're seeing doctors that are prescribing more and more medicines just for those two things. So what are we to do? I think it's important for us as believers to step back for a moment and just remember who we are. And to do, and to do that, we need to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Because according to this passage, Paul says, 
Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit whom you got from God and that you're not your own? You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And then we're reminded also of one of our main priorities that we are to have as believers. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ. Be reconciled to God. We have a mission. And Peter points this out in light of the coming judgment. In light of this coming judgment that is going to take place in this fallen world that we live in, we have a responsibility. And that has to come as you feel led by God on what you're, how you're going to react to this. But here's what Peter lays out before all of us. And I think it impacts and affects each of us. First, we should be holy. And what does that mean to be holy? It means that we should be separate from the things of the world. Because we're told here, again in verse 11, this whole world is going to be dissolved. All that we hold as precious is going to go by the wayside. It's not going to last. It's not going to be remembered. It's not valued to God. What, value, what God values are His things. And so the question has to be asked, what are we valuing? If God were to take a look at everything that we have acquired in this lifetime, would it fit into our suitcase? Or is our suitcase too big? Would it fit into the palm of our hand? Or is that too big also? Would he say it's all to be burned? To be holy means that we are set apart to be used for things of God. We were reminded in 1 Peter, as Peter started off, he says, Be holy, for I am holy. We are to have the character that our Father has. Not only that, we are to be godly. He says we are to show reverence towards the things of God and to God Himself. And we demonstrate this by our morals. To say that a person is godly is to view his moral characters and to view the characters of character, the character of God Himself and how a person applies that to their life. For a godly man seeks those things that honor and highlight the very character of God. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, it says, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, and regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. That's godliness in action. The third thing that Peter points to us, and he mentions this twice, we should anticipate the coming of Christ. Notice that the first time he says in verse 12, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. The day of God and the day of the Lord is the same day. But looking for and hastening it, how can we hasten that? Well, by sharing the gospel, the more people who believe, the quicker that day will come. In verse 13 he says, nevertheless, according to the promise, look for. Twice we are reminded to look forward. It's important that we as believers keep that in mind that we are to constantly be looking forward to things as opposed to looking behind. We can't change the past, but everything that we have is to be looked at towards in the future. Because it's in the future that what we see ahead of us that holds of all value to us. That's where our inheritance is. That's where our position is. That's where our purpose and our desire is. Seek these things where... Christ is seated. That's what we are supposed to focus our attention on. The new heaven is characterized as dwelling where righteousness is. So, here again in verse 13, where righteousness dwells is where this new heaven and new earth is at. Would you say that our society reflects righteousness as its main characteristic? I wouldn't either. I think I would describe it as violent, out of control, in need of the Messiah. It's not hard to look at some of our major cities 
And I can't understand why week after week, day after day, there are more shootings in places like Chicago. And it seems like those who are in charge can't do anything to stop it. Can't stop the constant shooting, except blame somebody else. Or we can't stop mob violence. We can't stop the destruction of property, graffiti, the burnings. Why can't we? I look forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness will dwell. And the reason righteousness will be there is because the Messiah will be there amongst there. And he is righteous. So let me conclude with this. What do we need to do as believers? There's two things. The first thing is we need to work on our behavior. I think that's pretty clear. On our, what areas do we need to work on as believers? Are we at the spot where we need to be in our holy conduct, in our godliness? I don't know. But I would challenge you to take a good look at that and focus in those areas. Because those areas will provide a means of opportunity for you to share people the good news of Christ. The second area I think that we should focus on, well, is just that is our focus. What is our, our, t- our main attention upon? Is it upon the end of the work week, just making it to Friday so we can party on? Is it working towards retirement so we can get out of our work and relax and have the good life? Is it waiting for our graduation for our kids? Peter and the rest of the New Testament writers say our focus needs to be on the return of Christ. That's what our main focus is. So what do we need to do to start focusing upon that? As we spend more of our attention upon who Christ is and what He has done, that will transform and change our overall focus and our our purpose here on earth. As we move into our quiet, our life groups, I shouldn't say our quiet times today, as we move into our life groups today, Remember to go through the questions together. And if you come up to something and you're stumped and you can't answer that or you're struggling with the question, text me and I'll hop into your life group and try to answer the question the best I can. Let's close together in prayer. Then we follow, we thank you for the reminder and the need to be reminded of your return. Uh, As bad as things are, in our society, Lord, you have placed us here that we might make a difference, that we might be your people to be used for your honor and glory, that we might be a witness for you and and to tell others. You did not put us in a different time of history. You placed us right here, right now, that we might be used for you. So, Lord, we open up the hands of our heart and ask you, Lord, to use us. Remove those things that hinder us from being used by you. Help us to be bold and courageous in the time period that you've given to us. And Lord, we lay our life, our lives that you have given to us back on your throne and say, here I am, Lord, use me for your honor and glory. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. See you in your life groups.